thank you all for coming. I know I know you have a lot of things that you could be doing, but I, I love that you came here to, to talk about web apps and things, and I hope that I have good things for you to bring away from this. So I'm going to talk about using developer tools and JavaScript for pen testing web apps. My name is Bibi. I'm a pen tester at Black Hills InfoSec. The other title for this is Modern Web App Pen Testing, which is the class that Jason talked about earlier that, I'm, uh, that I have where I go into more depth on this and other topics and how to pen test web apps in the 2020s because it's, it's different than it used to be. So if you think way back, Web 2.0, um, we used to have the web and it didn't have a number and then it became web 2.0 and that's when like all the new technologies came out right there was a uh, XML HTTP request and there were things that more interactive the the sites moved from being just like delivering static content to being more dynamic and generating you know specific things for specific users and things like that that was in 1999 when that term came out I looked it up I could not believe that it was that old and there is no Web 3.0, you might be interested to know. But the, the difference between the early web and, and Web 2.0, which is what we're still living in, apparently, is, is the interactivity for the most part. And uh, that's what these developer tools can help you get at. If you look back to 2011, Time Magazine has 50 websites that make the web great in 2011. So it's not like looking back, this was published at the time. So I picked out a few of the sites that they had in their list of the 50 to illustrate what I think the web was like in 2011, which is close to the time I was learning how to do web app pen tests. I started in, I think, 2008 or so. So this is the, the web that I really got to know. Four of them here. Science Daily, it's, it's a bunch of text, right? Tech Meme, it's a bunch of text. Kickstarter, even Kickstarter is kind of a bunch of text. And Health Grades, too, kind of a bunch of text. They look like newspapers, right? There's columns, there's regularly spaced text, and it's primarily text. If you look at those same apps now, they, they look a lot different, except for TechMeme. TechMeme is kind of the same. <laughs> they're, they're pretty happy with their, their column layout. But Science Daily here is, is responsive now. So responsive is like a magic word in, uh, in web app development, and it means that as you resize the page, things shuffle around to give you a slightly different view. So for Science Daily there, if you, if you shrunk the, the, the window down even further, the, you know, the brain picture and the Milky Way picture would be, become bigger and they would just be stacked on top of each other. And so responsive apps is part of a Web 2.0 thing that didn't used to happen. Kickstarter, more pictures now. Health grades, they discovered the psychology of getting people to give up their email addresses by putting a big form up at the top before you can do anything. Four more, because these are a little bit different. We had Map My Run, so we started up with some, started some social stuff started up around then. Facebook had been around for a while, but um, other things started doing more social stuff, less delivering of static text uh, and, and blocky newspaper-ish looking sites, and more user-generated content, more, um, more interactive type things. So we had Map My Run, Google Plus launched in 2011, Clout, was becoming a thing in 2011. And this was like a reputation management type thing, like you would get clout points for doing things. And I don't remember what they were used for, but that's like the early days of the, the, the influencers on uh, Instagram, it was clout. And then Pinterest on the right there, Pinterest was, uh, was coming up as well. And this is kind of, this is, this is a great example, I think, of the web 2.0 stuff that we, this is, it's all user-generated content. Pinterest themselves don't, doesn't do much of what's on their website. Everything there is, is user-generated. But even then, see, it was columns, it was text, there was some tags you could click on, things shuffled around, a little bit more interactive. And these, same web apps in 2001, Map My Run is still there. It's a whole lot more graphical, right? See, it used to be, there's a lot of space there, a lot of uh, space that wasn't used for anything, and now it's all filled in, and you can, you can sync your uh, run data with your shoes, which is something everyone needs. Google Plus didn't work out. Cloud didn't work out. Pinterest is still there, but now they're they've they kind of like the the health grades thing. They want you to sign up before you can see anything. So they're um they're again they're more trying to influence how you interact with the website rather than just 
giving you what they want to give you. BHRS was here in 2011. This is what our site looked like in 2011, if you're curious about that. That picture, I think, I think that might be John's front yard. Yep, that is so embarrassing, but thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Hey, yeah, yeah. So in 2011, I think you could you could put pretty much all of the websites there were in these three categories. You had you had newspapers and things like newspapers, things that were just delivering a lot of text. So they write it and they present it to you and you read it as if it were a book or just a stream of text. We had e-commerce, which I think it's funny that we still use that term, but it makes sense, right? E-commerce. Amazon, buying things online, that's all e-commerce. And then Proto Social, the, the early social app stuff. And what those all had in common in 2011 was they would largely come from a single domain. We were just starting to get into um, what they called at the time mashups, which was you know pulling some information from this site and some information from that site and delivering it in one page. That was, um, that was innovative and new at the time. Most things came from a single domain. If you wanted analytics to see how people were using your site to see you know, how long did they stay on the page and where did they click when they got here and that sort of stuff. That was Google Analytics and that was pretty much your only option. There were, um, there were some paid options at the time, but if there's one thing we learned from the web, it's that people like free things better than things that cost money. So everything, um, everything was Google Analytics. HTML5 was three years out from being an accepted draft. It was out there, but it was a draft. Cores, the um, cross-origin resource sharing, which is the thing that makes those mashups possible, that was still a draft for three more years. If you wanted to have some some active content on your page, you didn't use uh, XML HTTP requests. Microsoft actually invented that. People don't don't remember that. They like to. This was still in the days when Microsoft was. Um, yeah, people like to beat up on Microsoft just because they were so big. This is when it's starting to turn a little bit. I think they were getting to be a little bit more uh, more open and uh, and developing some standards that we still use today, like as XHR. There were Java applets and there was Flash. There were like tons and tons of pages and pages of Flash games. You could waste your entire day never doing anything but Flash. Silverlight was Microsoft's Flash killer. Both of those are kind of done now. And ActiveX, of course. So why are we talking about 2011? Didn't we start in 1999? I jumped up to 2011. What's what's going on? We're talking about 2011 because 2011 is when this fantastic book was published, the second edition. This is still my go-to reference for testing web apps. We This is when, when we uh, hire an intern to come work with me on web apps. I get them a copy of that book because it's fantastic. It's, it's, look how thick it is. It's, it's a tome. I mean, that is an achievement uh, to put all that stuff in, in one place, but it hasn't been updated since then. And I don't know of another book that is as comprehensive and thorough and reliable as this one is. If, if you do, I would love to hear about it. If you know about other books uh, or other references that are not like online classes, that talk about web app pen testing. I would love to, to see what some of those are. They, uh, they haven't stopped now. The guy that wrote this is the same guy that wrote uh, Burp Suite, and he hasn't stopped producing content. He just stopped doing it in a book. If you go to the link on this slide, he's got, or his company has online learning resources now. So things that used to, might have in the past gone into an update to the book, they now put those online as articles on their website. And they also have, the best thing about it is they have places where you can play with them all. So they'll talk about a vulnerability and, and where it comes from and how it manifests and how you can determine if it's there or not. And then they have labs that are online and free where you can see how it actually works right there, like right after you've read about it. So in a lot of ways, it's better than a new book, but there, um, there hasn't been another book since 2011. So a lot of what people know about testing web apps, I think, stems from what's in this book. Some places, if you ask them, like, what's your pen testing methodology, they'll, um, they'll point to chapter 20 or 22 in here, which is available as a PDF because everybody uses that <laughs> as the basis for their, their, um, their methodology. Uh, very influential book, very good book. I still recommend it, but things have moved on a lot since then. And the thing about testing web apps, the thing about testing anything, really pen testing anything, 
seriously, I think, is you need to understand how the thing you're testing works in order to break it in interesting ways. I was going to say you have to know how it works in order to break it, but that's not true. You can break things with no knowledge at all. But if you're breaking it with an eye towards making it better, you have to know how it's supposed to work. So you can see where those weak areas are, and you can explain to somebody why something happened the way it did and maybe why it shouldn't have happened that way. And then, of course, the next question is, well, yeah, it's broken. How do I fix it? You should know something about how to fix it as well. You don't have to be an expert in breaking and fixing, but you should at least know a good chunk of, of fixing if you're breaking things. So you have to keep up because these things change. They change that it's constantly changing. I mean, there's a joke about, you know, there's new, a new JavaScript framework like every 15 minutes, which is almost not a joke. Uh, it's hard to keep up, and you have to actively do that, and using old references is not a great way to keep up. So keeping up is the same thing as learning something initially, right? You just have a better base of knowledge to build on. So you continue to do the same things you did when you learned the technology, keep up with how the technology changes. You use the knowledge that you've built up as, as your kind of base to draw on and to draw inferences on how things might be different now. The, you know, there's assumptions in the old ways of doing things that might be different in the new ways of doing things. And a lot of times that's where the weaknesses come in, is an assumption that used to be true is no longer true. And if, if the, the folks building those frameworks and building those tools didn't make that mental switch, that's where you get some vulnerability sometimes. So how do you learn about web apps? How do you learn about how they are built? And this is, this is why I love web apps, because uh, I, I didn't go to school for, um, for computers. So how, how did I learn web apps? I learned web apps with ViewSource. Uh, ViewSource has been there since the first graphical web browser, Mosaic, in I think it was 1993. And ViewSource is, it just gives you, it shows you what the HTML was that was downloaded to build the page that you're looking at at the time. And it's still there, you can still use it, but originally, that's all there was. It was the HTML, and in the HTML, there were references to other things like images and you know, style sheets and things like that that get pulled in that affect how that content was rendered, but doesn't change the content itself. That's one of those assumptions that's different now. Uh, view source is still there in your browser, it still works, but chances are very good that what view source shows you is old, I guess. It's, it is what the web browser downloaded from the server, but things have happened since then, so it's different now. The, you've, got, you've got scripts running, you've got content being pulled in from different places, so the source of that HTML page is not as useful now as it used to be. From there, we, we had GreaseMonkey. If anybody remembers, GreaseMonkey was a JavaScript framework that you could use to modify pages locally on your own system. Then Firebug came along. Firebug was the, 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 the that was what developer tools was built from. Uh, it was a, a debugger built for Firefox in 2006, and now we have developer tools. So Firebug is gone because we have developer tools. GreaseMonkey is still here too. I looked that one up, as is view source. So that's how you learn how web apps look. You look at how somebody else built something, and you, you try to figure that out. Hey, how did they get this, this piece positioned on top of that piece? Or when I move my mouse over, you know, something changes. How do they do that? It's all right there. It's all right there in the browser. It, they cannot help but give you all that information because the browser needs it too. That's why I love web apps, because it's all just self-contained. So if you were thinking about how would I build a web app that I, I'm going to share images, I want people to be able to share their photographs or their screenshots or their memes or whatever, and, and I, want to, I, I want to build that. What's that going to look like? Well, a lot of places have done that already. So you can go and see how they've done it. The, the fun one to look at is, that, is Im, Im, Imgur. I don't know how you say that. I-M-G-U-R. It's one of those things I've only ever seen in writing. But it's a place to share pictures and memes and things, and it's it's enormous. It's it's uh, it pulls down a ton of things. It's one of those infinite scrolling things. So um, it, it's it's instructive to take a look at that through the developer tools and just see how all that complexity works and how all those different pieces come from different places and get pulled into one coherent view. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Interesting question, especially for, with your background, I think. They're talking about 
as far as learning and getting into pen testing, red teaming, detection, incident response, web application pen testing. How can you rank web, applica web application pen testing from future opening standpoint? So what's the job prospect? What's the future look like for it? Oh, boy. <clears throat> Predictions are hard, right? I, I think I think the web's not going away, and I think people are going to need to continue to build web apps. And I think we're going to follow the same path we've been following, which is that people don't write HTML anymore. They use frameworks to generate stuff for them. So web apps are getting further and further from what actually happens in the browser. The, the tools that developers interact with are, are getting farther and farther away from that. So the understanding of how the technologies actually work at that lower level is is diminishing, but it's just as necessary as it's always been. Developers don't need it quite so much as they used to because of all those frameworks, but pen testers need it because that's you learn how it works, you learn how to break it. So I think web apps is is a great place. I don't think I don't see that going I don't see that diminishing at all over time. You can start as a developer if you if you're doing web app development, that's perfect. If you want to get into pen testing and you're doing development, then use what you know and move over. Just start looking for ways to test your own apps for for, uh, for for vulnerabilities and keep your eyes open for when there's an opening in the security group where you're at, be that security person on the team. Uh, it's a great place to start. That's how I started. So with the, um, the developer tools, it's not just view source. It gives you a way to see how a page is built. You can see which host it's talking to. You know, it's not just one request and response. It's a bunch of them. You can see who it's all talking to. You can use them to pull information out of a page. You can target things that you're interested in and pull those things out using JavaScript. You can change the app's behavior by using JavaScript and using the inspector. Different browsers, we talked about this a little bit before the show started, uh, different browsers have similar tools. They're, they're not identical. It's not like there's a standard set of tools that they each implement on their own. They have a similar goal, and that's to help developers, not pen testers, but developers. They're all similar. They have similar tools. I'm going to show you the Firefox tools because that's the one I'm the most familiar with. There's links on this page here to the Firefox documentation and the Chrome documentation. And if you're really interested to see how they work, Greg Malcolm has a fantastic project on GitHub and a talk that he's given several times called Raiding the Armory. That little store that sells medieval weapons, that's the, that's the project. But he talks about using developer tools and shows you how to use developer tools as a developer to fix problems in your web page, to find bottlenecks and, uh, and inconsistencies and things. That's his presentation is what turned me on to using the developer tools in pen testing. So take a look at that if you're interested. So where are these developer tools? They're under F12 or Control Shift I or Command Option I, depending what uh, what uh, operating system you're using. And once you get there, I, I would encourage you to do this now. If you've got Firefox on your system, open it up and and look. Open up just any random web page and and go into the developer tools and see what you see there. And you can play along as I show you the things that I find interesting. In the developer tools, there's a tool called the Console. A lot of people conflate the two. They'll say developer tools and console interchangeably, but the console is just one of the tools. There's also the inspector. This is similar to view source, but it's better because it shows you the current state of the thing, not just how it was when it was downloaded from the web server. In Firefox, there's an optional tool called the DOM, the, the uh, document object model. So you can see uh, it gives you a top-down view of the object structure that is the document that you're looking at. So it's easy to find things that way from the top down if you want to go. Uh, you can think of that as top down. Think of inspector as bottom up. So inspector, you're going to pick a particular thing and say, how does this fit in the page and, and what systems were applied to make this the way it is? Whereas with the DOM view, you're going to say, what's on this page? What might be interesting about it? There's a storage tab. It's like little databases, like little earthquakes, but it's little databases. So um, there's actual databases in there. There's uh, local storages in there. The cookies are in there. There's a network tab that shows you what all the requests and responses were. And then there's actually a debugger built into there, which is literally a, a debugger. You can, uh, you can go through all the, um, the scripts that are part of that page. You can set breakpoints. You can examine variables and see what they're set to and how they change over time. There's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of value in that. 
this is the view that you probably have of the developer tools if you just kind of poked at them casually. This is what happens if you right click on something and do inspect element. You can see on the left there, the inspector tab is, is blue. That's the one we're looking at. There's three columns. The one on the far left is, is kind of like the view source. That's where, we're, that's where we're starting here. The one in the middle shows you the cascade, the cascading style sheets cascade. This is showing you what the, all the different styles that were applied and which ones were overridden. So you can see in the middle there, the padding has lines through it. That means that those it, it, it used to have padding of zero pixels, but something else more specific has overridden it. And so now it's different. And then on the right, you see that the thing that's highlighted there is called computed. So this is what happens at the end of the cascade. This is what's actually being shown in the browser after all that other stuff has happened. So, so the source that was downloaded, the calculations that happened to figure out what the style is going to be applied at the end, that's what you get on the right. So this is interesting, not so much from a pen testing point of view, but but from a structure of the web page. This is this is how they are rendered. It's not just what comes down from the the web server. Things happen afterwards, and this helps you to see what some of those things are. Hey CJ, hey, yes. hi. Any concerns with HTTP two changing things? Concerns. Yeah, always a little bit of concern, right? HTTP2 is it's out there and it's it's actively used. the The handy thing about HTTP2 from a pen testing standpoint is that uh, the application itself isn't really affected by whether you're using 1.1 or 2. That it's a little bit lower layer than that. So if you're testing web applications, in my experience, it doesn't matter if they're using HTTP2 or HTTP 1.1. If you're testing the infrastructure, the web server itself, then yes, then, then you're more interested in, um, in the HTTP version because that's what the server has to process. But by the time the application gets it, it's bubbled up above the HTTP version. So if you're testing the application, the version of HTTP, I think, doesn't matter. Hmm. And then... Web apps and API testing, they go hand in hand or don't cross the streams? They, it's best when they go hand in hand. Uh, the APIs, so web APIs are like little web applications, but there's no rendering of the response and the requests can be a lot more complicated. Um, so the difference is that you don't have a browser for the APIs. And a lot of the vulnerabilities that you hear about, like cross-site scripting, is only a vulnerability because you have a JavaScript interpreter in the browser. So I would, I would say that in web APIs, you cannot have a cross-site scripting vulnerability because it's just an API. There is no client assumed to be involved. So cross-site scripting happens in the browser. If there's no browser, there's no cross-site scripting. Doesn't mean you shouldn't call it out because that might be it might be an issue based on where that information goes later on. But strictly speaking, there is no cross-site scripting in a web API. The reason they go together, though, is for uh, for a web app, you can figure out how it works by just clicking through it. it. It shows you what it's able to do, and you click on stuff until you get the results that you want or find out that you can't get that result. But with APIs, there's there's nothing to help you. There's just a list of here's all the inputs, and if you send me all these inputs, you'll get these outputs. And there's nothing necessarily about the APIs that tell you like what order they're used in, or where you would get those things from, or how the response is going to change if you include the whole set of inputs or just a subset of the inputs. There's a lot more that's on you as the tester to learn and understand about APIs than there is about the web app itself because the browser helps you so much with the web app itself. Awesome. Thanks. So the, um, the tools, you can, you can show them several ways. Just right-click Inspect Element. It usually pops up, I think, at the bottom. But you can move it to the right or the left. But that last one that I showed you, it's in a separate window. So you can have all the screen real estate you want in your tools and still have the viewport of the browser as big as you want. You can see the entire page, and you can see the entire tools as long as you have enough screen real estate for it. So don't overlook that. That's a really useful thing. So we're going to take a look at what this looks like. I think I was going to. There we go. So here we have the documentation for the Firefox developer tools in Firefox. So F12, and we open up 
the developer tools down here. And it remembers where they were last time, so I must have had them open down at the bottom last time I did this. But you can, if you want to move them, you can move them to a separate window. Now you have all the view that you had before and all the view that you need over here for this one. The only confusing thing about this, though, is it doesn't follow you. Like if I'm if I'm on the Firefox developer tools, you see in the head here it says uh, heading Firefox developer tools. If I click over to the Flickr page, this is still developer tools for um, Firefox. So that's never that's not going to change. So if you undock that to a separate window, it's on you to remember which tab you're actually looking at. So for the rest of this, I'm going to leave them uh, docked at the bottom because I'm not that good. <laughs> I can't keep track of all those things while I'm talking. So that is the, the console in a, separate, in a separate window. The debugger is right here. So you've got different, um, different scripts that come down. And you will, you will learn to hate minified JavaScript while you're in here. Because look at this. It's all one line. Difficult to troubleshoot. The network tab we will come back to. But what I wanted to show you here is you can always have the, um, the console. It can always be there along with whatever else you're showing. So here, if you just hit the escape key, I wish I could show you me hitting the escape key. It, it keeps a small copy of the console below whatever else is going on. And I recommend you always keep that open. Always keep the console visible and keep it on every pane. because the console tells you what's going on. The console is kind of the central point. If there were no other developer tools, the console would still be very useful because it shows you what's happening while the, while the page is getting rendered. While you're sitting there just waiting, sometimes JavaScript fires based on timers or based on other events. You'll see things happen in the console even when you haven't clicked on something. You see all the HTTP requests. You see the summary in a list, and you can see the detail very easily from there. It gives you references for the status codes, the HTTP response codes, and HTTP re request and response headers. So if you don't know what a particular header means or what the values are, like are we still using, um, uh, how, do you, how do you stop click checking? Is that still X-Frame options, or is there something new for that I can't remember? It's built in. Uh, you don't have to remember. You can click on the thing and find out. The best thing you'll see in the console, though, is, uh, is calls to console.log. So the thing about JavaScript, there are many things about JavaScript, but a thing about JavaScript is that there is no input and output in JavaScript. It has the only way you get output is uh, is the console, the console.log. Everything else happens within the the script itself. There's no like system dot out dot print line or anything like that. So when developers are writing their JavaScript and they want to know what's going on, they do what anybody would do, and they they need to write out variables sometimes to see does this have the value I expected it to have? Did this task complete? How long did I spend in this function? Those types of things. And all that stuff gets written to console.log if that's how the developer does it, and most of them do. They don't always pull that out before it goes to production. So a lot of times you will see tons of valuable information streaming by in the console just by having it open. So that's why I say have it open everywhere, because you never know when something interesting is going to pop up there. I, I, have, I have seen passwords show up in there because they get logged. Here's Oh, here's the password because there's a different password for production than the test region, and they forgot to uncomment that. So they log what the password was. And that may be the only place it shows up. You also get uh, browser errors and warnings. They, they do a great job trying to let you know what's coming because things change so fast, right? Change is always going on. And there's... Uh, uh, a, a given feature goes from, you know, a beta to something that's released and it's supported, and then it gets deprecated, which means, you know, we'll support you if you're already using it, but please don't use it in new, in new code, and then it actually gets removed, and then things that rely on it start to break. When Firefox does that, when they know something is coming up to be removed, they'll start putting warnings about it in the console. They did this with um, the, the case I'm most familiar with is they do this with a... Um, changes to their support for TLS. When, when they were going to get rid of TLS 1.1, they put warnings in here. If, if you connected to a website with TLS 1.1, it would say, hey, this is going away soon. So it gives you warnings. It also alerts on privacy blocks, things that are blocked for privacy reasons. This is useful for, 
for developers because sometimes the people who visit your site don't have the same values and ideas that you do about how the site should work. So they may have some privacy settings that, that conflict with features that you want to be working in the application. Mixed content is uh, clear text and encrypted content on the same page. A lot of these have a, a learn more link to them. You can see these, um, those, uh, a couple of top of uh, the, uh, the yellow ones. They will learn more link and they'll explain to you in great detail why that warning is there and what it means. So again, just have the console open and you will learn things because the browser is friendly. On the network tab, you'll see every request and response, every single one of them. And it looks a lot like the console at first, but it's, it's different. It doesn't have all the same things. We still have links there to the documentation about headers, but there's ways to filter what you see there. So you don't have to see every single request and response. Like if, you don't, if you're not interested in images, for example, you can just have those hidden. This is what that looks like initially. So you can see all the requests uh, and responses. You can see the status code there was 200. It was a get, the domain that it was sending it to, the file name, all those things. You can see what's going on. This one you see is, um, is filtered to only show images. Uh, up at the top there, you could filter to show all or HTML or CSS, just the things that you want. WS, that's the web sockets. You can see those in here too. And then when you click on any one of those rows, here's the, the detail you get initially. This is not all the detail you get. This is what you get initially. So here's the URL that it was sent to. Um, the HTTP version, the question about version 2 or 1.1, this was version 2. Then you have the response headers, followed by the request headers, because remember, this is for developers. They're more interested in what the response was than what the request was, I think, in most cases. And all of those in that vertical box there, every one of those that has a question mark next to it, you click on that question mark and it takes you to the, the Firefox developers documentation on what that header is used for. And then there's edit and resend, which is fascinating. Edit and resend is a lot like repeater in burp. So if you're familiar with that, it's just, it's, well, it's what it sounds like. Uh, it takes the request that you've sent and it allows you to send it again. So if we go here and reload this. I'm filtering just to HTML. So if I wanted to see them all, there's a ton of stuff here. But if you just want the HTML, if you want to edit and resend, it shows you what the request looks like. It was a get. This is where we were sending it to. Here's all the headers that were included. The request body is empty because it's a get, so there's no data in there. You might want to say, well, what happens if we, um, uh, where is, what if we, what if we don't accept all those same encodings? Maybe I'll get a different response there. This is the upgrade and secure request. That's the Firefox setting that says to try to use HTTPS every time you can. You can actually get rid of everything except the host and send this and now see what happens. So it sends it again from the browser. And just looking, you see it's probably the same thing. The size is about the same. You didn't get an error message. We got a 200 response. It probably didn't care. And that makes sense for this kind of a website. It's not going to care a whole lot. It's available to anonymous visitors. They're not going to worry too much about what those headers are. But if you had a request that was, maybe there was a number in it, maybe you're requesting item number seven. Well, what happened to change that to item number eight? Well, you could just change it to an eight and send it again. Again, only with permission. But you can do all those things right in here. You don't have to go to the proxy to do those things. It's all built in. Now on the network tab, we have the storage tab. And this is another one. CJ, was there a question? A few. How are you doing on time, Beth? Because I got lots of questions. Now. I'm doing all right. All right. On the storage tab, there's a local storage dropdown. Where on the disk, or where on disk is the data stored exactly? You know that? Oh, good question. I don't know the clear answer. I believe it's part of your, um, in part of your, your profile directory. Like on Windows, it's the you know, percent app data, percent um, Mozilla, Firefox profiles. It's in there somewhere. I don't know exactly where it is. I think it's just a SQLite database. But I'm actually going to get into storage here in a minute. So we'll go about that. <laughs> Why? <laughs> right. Why does the console tab show an error for almost any page when I open DevTools, even www.google.com as an example? Um, I, I don't know. 
it depends what the error would be. Could be a local network problem, maybe you can't actually load that page, or it could be something about that page isn't working the way it was intended to. Maybe you've got a privacy setting that blocks access to whatever it's trying to get to. You have to dig down and find find out. There's not a single answer to that question. Got it. Uh, Trevor says, I've always been confused on how to show the web sockets and identify what information is traversing it, when slash where. Are you able to elaborate on that? Yeah, web sockets, um, I, I don't see them all that often. We, we do see them, but not terribly often. And I, I have not tried to probe those using the developer tools. There was that tab there. They are, they are available in there. But I don't know how much flexibility you have to, to monitor those or repeat those. Uh, Burp Suite does have that. Burp Suite and, and Zap, the Z attack proxy from OWASP, they both let you view the web socket activity and repeat it and replay those things and modify them. That's where I would go. I would go with um, the whether you use Burp or Zap. I would look look for those things. In Burp, it's uh, it's on the proxy history tab. There's a tab called Web Sockets, I think. Someone then, asked if you could increase your browser size a little bit. Yep. I don't think I can. When you're doing the demos, if you can either oh, increase the size of the the browser. That's yeah. Cool. Yes. Yes. I will make the browser bigger. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So storage. Yeah, the uh, browser works. You can't zoom, though, unfortunately, with GoToWebinar. Okay. Got it. So in, in the storage tab, and I'll show you this, there's a screenshot on the right. There's the cache storage, there's cookies, there's index, DB, there's local storage and session storage. The cache is not the disk cache. There's a, um, uh, it's the cache interface from the web APIs. I've never seen anybody using this yet. It's, it's always empty when I go to look. The cookies are cookies. So a lot of pen testers, myself included, likes to have a plugin in the browser or an add-on that lets you add and edit cookies. You don't need it. You can do it all here in, um, in the storage thing. Indexed DB, also I rarely see this one used, but this is like the biggest place. This is the place where you can store the most data. It's, it's structured data. It's, actually, it's, a, it's an actual database. There's local storage which is uh, that you get five megabytes per origin, and this is persistent. So it is stored on disk. I don't know exactly which file it's in, but it is stored on disk. There is session storage, which is the same thing as local storage, except like a session cookie, it never gets written to disk. It, it goes away as soon as you close that browser. And the interesting thing about these and the developer tools is none of this stuff is going to show up in your proxy. The, the proxy doesn't know about local storage. It doesn't know about index DB. It does know about cookies, but... It's, it's better with cookies that are set in an HTTP response with that set cookie header. If, if a cookie is set by JavaScript, you won't see it happen in, the, in your proxy. They're just all of a sudden, there'll be a cookie that wasn't there before. I actually had uh, to trace this down with another, another tester like two weeks ago. He's like, this cookie's just showing up out of nowhere. What's going on? And that's what it was. JavaScript was setting the cookie. So here, you have all the cookies, no matter where they came from. So it's a little bit better than the proxies in that sense. So this, this is the cookie thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you this live instead of looking at it here. But basically, you've got a list of all the cookies that are set from that origin or from anything that's on that page, and you can change anything about them, which is pretty awesome. So bigger. Hey, I wonder if I can do, uh, nope, the Zoom thing doesn't affect the to developer tools. So let's go to storage. Is that better? That's what I got. Uh, so you can. So these are the Google Analytics cookies um, with your little identifier in there. So if you don't want to be tracked, you can say stop it, and that that's what your cookie is set to now. When you're pen testing things, if you see something that is false, you got to wonder what it happens if it's true. And then that you would here, so that's a, a unique identifier probably. So maybe somebody else has 58. I wonder what that would be. So those are now changed in my browser. And if I reload the page, if any of those had any effect, I would see it in the results here. I, I doubt the survey was related to those. <laughs> but you can also add cookies. So there are some, uh, it gets a default GUID name just so they don't conflict. But, but the, the web app, that has a cookie called admin is not completely gone. They still exist. So you can set a cookie called admin true and see if you're suddenly administrator. 
and sometimes it works. And you can also delete cookies. If you don't want that one anymore, you can just delete that. Or you can delete all of the cookies, and they're gone. And then you reload, oops, reload, and then they're going to come back. So you can do anything you want with the cookies right in here with built-in stuff. You don't need plugins to do that. Like everything, I'm not saying the plugins are bad. These are just different ways to do the same thing. And sometimes one way is more effective or better or more interesting or more fun or less boring than the other way. And you got to take what you can get. So the inspector is, is like view source, but it's better. We talked about this. It shows you with the current state of the thing. And um, this is, you know, you right click on something and inspect element. This is, this is where you get taken to for that. Uh, you can use this to, um, to reveal text in password fields. This is the, the, the simplest illustration I could come up with to show why this is valuable. And you can also execute functions in the console and you might need to use the inspector to know what to type in there. So this, this bit of JavaScript here is hopefully fairly self-explanatory. This is not super complicated JavaScript. This is from a reference for the Crypto.js library. And this is how they suggest that you, you would use it to encrypt data in the browser. In the browser. And look, the last line there, console.log. That's why developers use it, because it's handy and because it shows you what's going on, and that's, that's how everything is presented. It's a way to check what's going on. So if you found this, you could just run this. If that console.log thing wasn't there, you could add it. You could say, hey, there's, there's some encrypted text here, but now I know from looking at the script that there's a variable called original text that contains the plain text value of that thing. So you can just type console.log original text, and it will show you the decrypted thing. So for the... Inspector, I'm using Wikipedia for no good reason. But if you were to try to log in here, so let's, let's look at the password again, just to inspect element on the password. And we'll make this a little bigger. So here it is. Uh, the inspector is cool. You, you mouse over this, and it shows you how, what that corresponds to up above. And you can see here there's no, um, there's no value in the password field right now. And the name of the password is... WP password one. So if I were to say console.log WP password one, that's the object. And if I wanted to see WP password one dot value, so what's typed into there? Where did it go? It's undefined. So if I were to type the password in and then run that again. It's still undefined. It shouldn't be. I'm doing something wrong. Is it just person password? live demos? Right. The demo gods are not amused. <laughs> no, they're not. Well, I won't make. Well, you and we have some people talking clear. about modifying cookies while BB is working with this. And using proxies like Burp and Zed Attack Proxy, and I, I think that there's some absolute truth to that, right? But what you'll find out as you start doing a lot of web application pen testing is you'll end up in a situation where you start chaining these things together, right? So you might be using the built-in developer tools, and Jag just said dot value needs to be inside the prens, so that might actually be it. Love when people on Discord help out. But whenever right. you're doing this type of testing, it always helps to kind of chain a number of things together. And for a while, we used to actually use, use tools like Skipfish and things like that that we could actually chain them together as well. So, so yes, those are great tools, but this is another one. So, BB, just go ahead and move right. on. Uh, we can yeah. move on to the next one. It would work if I could type correctly. So if you see something that's masked in here, the, again, there are a bunch of ways to get at it, but here's one that maybe you didn't know. You can just pull it out. Using, using developer tools right here. You can also uh, change content. John hinted at this earlier. You can, it's just kind of fun to play with. It's good for practical jokes. You can make any website, any web page say anything you want it to say. So, so I don't know, some of you are new here and you might not know how much John hates clowns. But this is a real tweet of his. If you go to that URL, you'll see a real tweet, but it doesn't say what this one says. So 
it's fun to play with. It's fun for practical jokes, and it should tell you that don't always trust screenshots. You can you can fake them very very well. So there's a debugger, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the debugger because it takes some setup. But just know that it's there. You can find you can stop JavaScript execution while it's going on. So if something only appears for a, you know a tiny fraction of a second and then disappears, and you want to know that thing, you can you can put a breakpoint in and get it. So for that one, you're on your own. Uh, there is a lab for it though in the class. You can customize the tools with F1. You can enable and disable panes. That DOM pane that I mentioned isn't always there. There's dark mode if you're a big dark mode fan. So here's the, where the JavaScript comes in. So what can you ask the console about? You can ask it a lot of things. Console.log, whatever. So console.log top. Top is an object, and, and that has a lot of stuff in it. Top and window are actual synonyms. It was, I was, could never remember which one was which. I thought they were different things for a while, but they're actually equal. That triple equals in JavaScript means these two things are the exact same thing. And you actually don't even need to type console.log. It's it's a, it's a REPL like is like um like in Python, the it, it shows you the result of the operation. So the result of that comparison is true. You don't have to tell it also to log in the console. You can get all the anchor links on a page. So why would you want to do this? Well, where what do we link to? They they might some of them might be hidden. Some of them there might be patterns here. They might be repetitive. Maybe I want to go through and see where all I can get to from this page. And here's three different ways you can do that. The, the old way, like, like if you learned JavaScript before jQuery, is you would do document.getElementsByTagName and then the tag name. But now there's, there's, there are collections in there that make these things easier for you. So just document.links is all the links. And if you type that, document.links, it'll show them all in the, in the console. And then if you're good with JavaScript, you can manipulate them there if you want to. If you're not so good with JavaScript, you can copy and paste it into a Python script or somewhere else and do what you want with those things. Maybe the links have a, a token in them and you want to see what all those tokens are, if there's some patterns to those tokens. That's a useful thing to do. Images is another collection that you don't have to do that get element by stuff anymore. So here's an actual pen testing thing that I actually do on, on some tests. I'm just going to add a parameter called admin equals true to all of the links and see if, if, if I get a different behavior when I click on that link. And this is the JavaScript that will do that. For link of links, that's not a typo. Of is a new JavaScript thing that saves you from having to dereference things. So you can do for link in document.links, but then you'd have to say, you know, link.i or link.1 or whatever thing that indexer goes in there. But link of document links gives you the actual object, so it's a little bit easier to type. So this goes through, and for every link in the document links, it takes that link href, and it adds to the end of it ampersand admin equals true. And then it also puts a blue highlight around it so you can see where that change happened. And now all of your links are admin links. And this is, I think we'll close with this one. This is the um, an example of where you might want to collect information from all of the, uh, the images. So this is just from the, uh, the Flickr's, um, one of the, a page of Flickr that has a bunch of different um, people's accounts on it. So if you're curious and you want to get, see, you know, maybe how do they assign those names, uh, those numbers, are those meaningful things? I want a collection of all the names I've seen so far. You can get this in the console, and then you could copy and paste that into a Python script if you like Python, or you could mess, mess with it here in JavaScript if you're good with the JavaScript. So well, the whole idea is that these things are already in the browser that you're using to test with or just to browse the web with. And you're playing with what's local on your system, as long as you don't do that edit and resend thing. You're not doing anything anybody will even know that you're doing. So you don't have to worry so much about permission or about breaking things. As long as you're not sending traffic that you've created, you're just clicking on links in the application. That's what websites are for, right? So it's a great place to learn about how web app pen testing. It's a great adjunct to the other tools that you use. Sometimes this is an easier way to get in and get quick information that you can get other ways, but um, maybe, maybe you don't need to.